I believe it's about time to get started before Rodney tells any more of his stories about smelling rain. I tell you what, that fantasy stuff. Is, I hope it does rain. We're, we're sure dry around here. All right, uh, our prayer list is pretty extensive. I, I won't go through it all. I will mention that Kyle Tigner's surgery went as well as could be expected, and he's scheduled to get out of ICU, I believe. And as I understand it, the cancer was contained, so that's great news. Um, One thing I bet, I bet he's ready to get out. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, yes, let us know when you find something else out. That's all right. Uh, Mark Doris is scheduled for surgery on Tuesday morning. Let's remember the families who have lost loved ones, the Jamie Taylor family, and Ryan lost uh, a relative. The shut-ins, Miss Barbara Bass and Mike Coleman, let's keep them in our prayers and our mind and, and go by and see them every time you get a chance. I think that this coming Thursday, they're gonna do nails out at the care center. Is that right, Judy? Well, yep, she's back there visiting, so that's okay. Nails this Thursday, is that right? This Thursday, Okay, this Thursday, 9.30. Men's business meeting tonight. Uh, Sarah Gospel meeting will start September 10th. It starts tonight and goes through the 13th. Uh, the times are 10 a.m., 11 a.m., and 7 p.m. Uh, let's see, Wednesday evenings are 7 p.m. The questions people are asking, uh, why do bad things happen to good people? Why am I here, and does everyone go to heaven? Family meal will be on Wednesday night, September the 20th, and that will be up here at the Mulpey Purpose Building, so let's all attend that if we can. Uh, evangelism Seminar, Wednesday, or when is uh, Sunday through Tuesday, October 1st through 3rd, and that will be here, and Rob and Nicole Whitaker from House to House, Heart to Heart, are going to do this seminar, and hopefully, it, it sounds like it'll be very interesting, so let's try to make it to that. And Garrett's wanting some questions for for his lessons, so if you want to put a question back in that box on the in the foyer, that would be good. Uh, youth area wide gathering Sunday, September 24th at 5 p.m. Hydro, Oklahoma, at the Cornfield Maze. LTC. Youth Devotional, Saturday, October 14th at 5 p.m. And, and that'll be at, at Garrett's house. So I think that's all the announcements. Anything else going on that we need to announce? Okay. Evening. First song this evening will be number 308. 308. <clears throat>
number 827. 827. After this song, we'll have an opening prayer. next song this evening will be had it not been the lord this is not in the book if you need a paper let me get some. both verses.
Good evening. I hope that we get to continue to learn that song. That is one that we introduced a few months back at the uh, uh, time we had to learn new songs. And so uh, that's what uh, we're going to keep working on that one. And I appreciate you leading that for us. Uh, I wonder what it sounded like uh, back then because that is directly from a song. Psalm 124, if you want to be turning there, is uh, where we're going to look at to begin with, uh, because that's where the words come from, uh, from this song. And so again, I wonder if we're singing it anywhere close to to the same. Uh, Probably not, and we'll never know, but uh, it still sounds so good to sing, and the words uh, still mean uh, as much as they meant back then. the, the same, uh, they mean the same for us today. But taking a look at, at Psalm 124, you, you might have in your, uh, the uh, inscription above it, uh, it might say, a song of a sense of David. So this seems to tell us that's not inspired, but it does seem to be uh, pretty reliable that that is a psalm of David. Uh, this psalm that we'll be examining this evening, um, and that is the, the King David. There's not too many Davids in uh, the Bible, which I find interesting, but there is uh, the, the main one that we know of, uh, the man after God's own heart, called that in 1 Samuel 13, 14. As, uh, that's what God was looking for. Uh, while the people of God were looking for you know, a king and someone who looked like a king, God was looking for someone who is after his own heart. Uh, And Acts chapter 13 says the same thing in verse 22, that this man David was uh, a man after, one who sought after God's own heart. Uh, He's also, as we know him, to be the son of Jesse. Uh, 2 Samuel 23.1 tells us these three things about King David, is that he's the son of Jesse, but he's the sweet psalmist of Israel. Uh, I just find that... uh, Interesting, and, and maybe he was like the like the man we looked at this morning, Tillit S. Tedley, uh, and all the songs that he wrote. David wrote many of the psalms, and so he's the sweet psalmist of Israel, is uh, what God calls him here. And then he's also the anointed of the God of Jacob, and it's interesting to me that that anointed, the word for anointed is Messiah. Well, he wasn't the Messiah, but he was the anointed one in those days, uh, and Jesus would follow after him to be these things but as we take I want to take a moment to discuss and maybe remind us of what the Psalms of Ascent are before we get into the text and the lessons Uh, Psalms of Ascent were songs that were sang on the Israelites way into Jerusalem three times a year there were three major feasts that they were required to go back to Jerusalem to Uh, partake of these feasts and if you could guess them uh, maybe in your mind very quickly uh, the first one you might say is the Passover that was one of them in Leviticus chapter 24 it's going to 23 verses 4 through 8 it's going to detail uh, these things you have Leviticus and maybe Mark in your uh, Bibles Psalm 124 we will be back but uh, taking a moment to look at these feasts that God set up In Leviticus 23, verse 4 through 8, it says this, These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. On the fourteenth day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. And so this kind of describes uh, in the law what the Passover was, but the idea was that they would come to Jerusalem uh, for this feast. They would also come to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. And that feast is described in verse 16, uh, often also titled the Feast of Weeks. Uh, Feast of Weeks. 
In verse 16, it says, Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. Uh, this was going to be the day of Pentecost, as uh, we see in Acts chapter 2. Uh, but these Psalms of Ascent, three times a year, this last one, the Feast of Tabernacles, found in Leviticus 23, verse number 34, uh, another way, uh, or another feast, it says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. And so and he would go on to describe what would take place in these. But it was required for the Jews to go to Jerusalem these three times a year. And there were other, others that, uh, other feasts. But on the way there, any way you would go to Jerusalem was going up because Jerusalem was set on a hill. It was on a mountain top. And so Psalms of Ascent seem to give us that idea that they would ascend up to the mountain of Jerusalem. And also I think there's a spiritual aspect of that, that they were ascending to where God would meet them for these uh, three uh, settings of worship and, and holy convocation to him. Um, but when the Jews were making these treks, they sang these songs. And I say these, there's a whole collection of them uh, in Psalm, uh, around Psalm 124. Um, so let's read Psalm 124, and then we'll take some lessons from it. Uh, but Psalm 124, for a moment. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. David truly felt these words. If he is indeed the writer, he certainly did, and we're going to take a look at that. Because the first lesson we learn from this is that people, the world, will be against us. will be against God's people at times, and often, more often than not. But again, in the song and in the psalm, the anger of the enemy would have swallowed us alive. The water would have engulfed us. We would have surely died had it not been for God. We'll get to that last part secondly, but the world is generally against God's people. Psalm 56, verse 1 and 2, there are some who appreciate you know, Christianity and they are going to maybe promote you if you have an employer that uh, likes honesty and you are a Christian and you are honest in, in, uh, in, in your employment, then they're going to like that. But that's not going to be the case all the time. And that's what I mean by there are some times the world is not necessarily against us, but for the majority, it is the case. Psalm 56, again, uh, of David, where he is, it says, a, a victim of David when the Philistines captured him in Gath. Verse 1 and 2, Be merciful to me, O God, for man would swallow me up. Fighting all the day, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me, O oh, Most High. David found himself often surrounded by the enemies of God. And that's certainly going to be the case against us. Not only you have the, the enemies, the Philistines here and, and others, but sometimes they were God's own people. Look with me in, in 1 Samuel chapter 23, and you'll see... David on the run from King Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 14 and following. And David stayed in the strongholds in the wilderness and remained in the mountains in the wilderness of Ziph. And look at what it says. Saul sought him every day. There wasn't a day that Saul said, I'm going to take the day off from, from hunting David like this animal for no good reason. Saul didn't take a day off. He, he would end up throwing a spear at him. I don't know how close he was. 
uh, and luckily and he, he missed or uh, whatever it was it, it didn't uh, kill David but Saul sought him every day and, and David's life was spent a lot on the run it wasn't just the family of Israel but David's own family pursued him at times if you take a moment to look with me in 2nd Samuel chapter 15 while, where David is now the king and he's ruling but his own son, Absalom, is going to steal the hearts of the people. Verses 1 through 6, read with me, 2 Samuel 15, 1 through 6. After this, it happened that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. So it was, whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision, that Absalom would call to him and say, What city are you from? And he would say, Your servant is from such and such a tribe of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, Look, your case is good and right, but there's no deputy of the king to hear you. So he was fending people away from hearing the, the rightful king. Moreover, verse 4, Absalom would say, Oh, that I were made judge in the land. And everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me, that then I would give him justice. He wanted the place of David, but he wasn't the anointed of Israel. And so it was, whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. In, the manner, uh, in this manner, Absalom acted toward all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. David's own son, one of his sons, was against him and eventually would put him on the run. And David has to flee Jerusalem, his own city, because of his son. And later on, verse 13 says, A messenger came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. So David, from this point on, is going to be on the run because his own people, his own family, are against him. And David's not the only one. You see, Solomon, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10 through 12. He's telling his, the, the next generation, Solomon is. He says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, Come with us, let us lie and wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol and whole like those who go down to the pits. Solomon says, If you don't comply... With these things, one, you're wise, but two, the world's going to be against you. If you don't go with them, it's implied here that they're going to be against you, and they're probably going to take you and try to swallow you alive. And the last one here on this point is Daniel chapter 3. Maybe you remember Daniel chapter 3. And his, uh, Daniel's, as we call him, the, the three friends. Their Hebrew names being Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But if, you're, if you recall, the king makes an image of gold and he says whenever uh, you hear these sounds, everyone in the city is supposed to bow down. Well, that would be idolatry. That would be bowing down, giving uh, praise to something that doesn't deserve it and, and putting uh, that thing in the place of God. And so the Hebrews, these three Hebrew men are, are bold, they're courageous, and they stand Look with me in verse number 8 of Daniel chapter 3. Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. And they're reminding the king of what he said. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. He says, here's what the law is. These people are, are, are coming to the king, and they said, verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you've set over Babylon, the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you've set up. When you tell when we tell people today that we don't serve their gods, we're not willing to bow down to what uh, the, the, the people of this day want us to do, they're going to be against us. They may not throw us into a fiery furnace today, 
hundred years from now, maybe so or less. But the people of God will be hated when they stand up for the things of God. The world will be against us. And that's what this psalm tells us. Not only would it happen to King David and so it's going to happen to us. We'll suffer for the gospel. And in doing so, we should glorify God. That's not the only thing that this psalm tells us. It tells us also to praise God for the way out that he provides. Blessed be the Lord who would not give us up. Blessed be the Lord for his unfailing love for us. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Because our help is in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. We learn from that that our God is for us. If he truly is our God and we are walking according to his ways, then he's for us. David was delivered from King Saul. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 26 through 29. This is interesting. Or look at verse, starting verse 25. When Saul and his men went to seek him, they told David. Therefore he went down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that he pursued David in the wilderness of Maon, then Saul went on one side of the mountain and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. God put a mountain literally between them to protect David. So David made haste to get away from Saul, for Saul and his men were encircling David and his men to take them. But a messenger came to Saul saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. And therefore Saul returned from pursuing David and went against the Philistines. So they called that place the Rock of Escape. David was able to escape because of God providing, and it seems like likely you could probably say that God provided the Philistines to go and attack Israel, or at least entice them in some way so that David could be saved in this uh, instance. David was God's anointed, and he was going to protect him. You also see David escape from the hands of his son Absalom. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 32 and following, Now it happened when David had come to the top of the mountain where he worshipped God, there was Hushai the archite coming to meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. This is a very interesting account. David said to him, if you go on with me, then you will become a burden to me. This is a good friend of David, someone who's loyal to him. He says, if you're coming with me because I've got to go, Absalom has taken the hearts of these people, you're going to be a burden. And look at what David says to him. Verse 34, But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I was your father's servant previously, so I will now be your servant, then you may defeat the council of Ahithophel for me. The council of Ahithophel was bad. David says you can be a voice for good if you stay Verse 35, And do you not have Zadok and Abiathar the priests with you there? Therefore it will be that whatever you hear from the king's house, you shall tell to Zadok and Abiathar the priests. Indeed, they have there with them their two sons, Ahimaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them you shall send me everything you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, went into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. David says, you can be a spy for me, basically. You can come and tell me Absalom's whereabouts and, and what he's going to do so that I can escape. I think David is, is, uh, is working and uh, letting God work through Hushai in this way. David would say in Psalm 118, verse 6, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? That's why David, when he was so young and as a shepherd boy, he could go against Goliath, this great man of war, against him, and he could say, my God is with me. I have no fear of what's before me because of who's behind me. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus tells us who to fear. He says, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. He says, don't fear men. 
at worst, they can kill your body. But if you are faithful to me, your soul will live on in an eternal life with me forever. And that's what God wants. In Romans 8, verse 31, What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, speaking to Christians, who can be against us? The answer is no one. No one can truly be. They, they'll try. The devil has tried over and over again since Genesis chapter 3. But he's failed over and over again as well. To thwart the plans of God. And I think about Daniel chapter 3 and, and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and they knew this about our God as well. It wasn't just David. But they said this, If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. They still stood firm. They said, our God is good enough, has the power to save us physically here. But they said, even if not, we're okay with that. We don't fear you. We fear the God that if we bow down to these false gods, we fear him greatly. We should. And same for us today. If our God is for us, who can be against us? But let's not make, uh, make it so that God is against us. He will be against us if we follow idolatrous practices like those in those days. I would imagine that maybe Daniel uh, or his three friends are not the only three that remain faithful to God. It's the only ones we know about for sure. But it's probably assumed as well that there were many who bowed down. They didn't stand firm. They didn't let God make a way of escape for them. But our God is for us. He wants to save us if we are willing. And so it's really on us. God's always there for those to turn to Him. We might be going far away from God by our own choices, but He's right there behind us waiting for us to turn around, hoping that we will turn around if that's the case. It's up to us to do the turning around. If we don't go to God, we're going to be swallowed up by the enemy. He'll swallow us up alive. And that's increasingly true in, in the world that we live in today, the country that we live in today. And we better be glad we don't live in other countries that persecute Christianity far worse than, than we are currently. We need to be thankful for that. We need to be thankful for our God who will save us. We cry out to Him. We turn back to Him. We trust in Him. The question of this hour is, do you and I trust in God like David did. Like Daniel, like his three friends. To say, even if God doesn't deliver me out of this fiery trial, I trust in Him. That's tough. But it can be done. They're here for us as examples. And they're cheering us on, saying, you can do it. You can get through the world that you live in because we got through the world of the Babylonian Empire in the, king, in the days of King Nebuchadnezzar. You trust in God. My hope is that you do tonight. If you need the prayers of the church, you need anything tonight, won't you come as we stand and sing the song of invitation.
you were unable to partake of the Lord's Supper, if you've been cut known. Okay. Final song tonight will be number 987. 987. And before that, we'll have a closing prayer. Our Father, Dad, that you have been thankful for this time we've been able to sit with the same day. Offer our worship to you, Father, we pray for the same day as I'm here. Tonight, you've been pleased to be beside. Father, again, we lift up those who were mentioned earlier in, in, uh, in, the, in the prayer list, and we just pray that you would be with them. Father, we know that you know their needs. Uh, we pray that you be attentive to them. Help us be attentive to them. Father, let us always be willing to uh, do your work here on earth. Father, help us always put our trust in you. We know that you're good and faithful to keep uh, the promises that you've made to us, and we, we just rely on that so much. We're so thankful for your son, Jesus, the life that you live, the life that you gave the world. I pray you do with us now as we separate and say, we ask in Jesus' name. Walking through the just like that, I won't be ready.